Among the great follies of humanity, a belief in alchemy is considered one of the best. Although based on a complex interpretation of Christianity through symbolism, for most people the idea brings up medieval charlatans in search of the means to turn one element into another. We can reasonably assume that alchemy died a quiet death sometime during the Age of Enlightenment. But we would be wrong. Records of genuine attempts at transmutation exist up until nearly the 20th century, and we should not be surprised that somewhere, an alchemist is hard at work in search of the Philosopher's Stone. Towards the close of the 18th century, Dr. James Price, a medical practitioner in the neighborhood of Guildford, Surrey, acquired some notoriety by an alleged discovery of methods of transmuting mercury into gold or silver. He had been a student of Oriel College, Oxford, where he obtained the degree of Bachelor of Physic. In 1782 he published an account of his experiments on mercury, silver, and gold, performed at Guildford, in that year, before Lord King and others, to whom he appealed as eyewitnesses of his wonder-working power. It seems that mercury being put into a crucible, and heated in the fire with other ingredients, which had been shown to contain no gold, he added a red powder, the crucible was again heated, and being suffered to cool, amongst its contents, on examination, was found a globule of pure gold. By a similar process with a white powder, he produced a globule of silver. The character of the witnesses of these manifestations gave credit and celebrity for a time to Price, who was honored by the university with the degree of Doctor of Physic, and he was also elected a Fellow of the Royal Society. Dr. Price had now placed himself in a perilous position, for persons acquainted with the history of alchemy must have conjectured how the gold and silver in his experiments might have been procured with any transmutation of mercury or any other substance. The Royal Society authoritatively required that the pretensions of the new associate should be properly sifted, and his claim as a discoverer be clearly established, or his character as an impostor exposed. A repetition of the doctor's experiments before a committee of the Royal Society was commanded on pain of expulsion, when the unfortunate man, rather than submit to the ordeal, took a dramatic draught of hemlock, and died on July 31, 1783, in his twenty-fifth year. Sir Walter Scott, in his well-known paper on astrology and alchemy tells us that about the year 1801, an adept lived, or rather starved, in the metropolis, in the person of the editor of an evening newspaper, who expected to compound the alkahest, if he could only keep his materials digested in a lamp furnace for the space of seven years. Scott adds, in pleasant banter, the lamp burnt brightly during six years, eleven months, and some odd days, and then unluckily it went out. Why it went out, the adept could never guess, but he was certain that if the flame could only have burnt to the end of the septenary cycle, the experiment must have succeeded. Perhaps the last true believer in alchemy was not Dr. Price, but Peter Walf, the eminent chemist, and fellow of the Royal Society who made experiments to show the nature of gold ore. Brand's History of the Society says. It is to be regretted that no biographical memoir has been preserved of Walf. I have picked up a few anecdotes respecting him from two or three friends who were his acquaintance. He occupied chambers in Barnard's Inn, Holborn, while residing in London, and usually spent the summer in Paris. His rooms, which were extensive, were so filled with furnaces and apparatus that it was difficult to reach his fireside. A friend told me that he once put down his hat, and never could find it again, such was the confusion of boxes, packages, and parcels that lay about the chamber. His breakfast hour was four in the morning, a few of his select friends were occasionally invited to this repast, to whom a secret signal was given by which they gained entrance, knocking a certain number of times at the inner door of his apartment. He had long vainly searched for the elixir, and attributed his repeated failures to the want of due preparation by pious and charitable acts. Whenever he wished to break an acquaintance, or felt himself offended, he resented the supposed injury by sending a present to the offender, and never seeing him afterwards. These presents were sometimes of a curious description, and consisted usually of some expensive chemical product or preparation. Of his last moments we received the following account from his executor, then treasurer of Barnard's Inn. By Walf's desire, his laundress shut up his chambers, and left him, but returned at midnight, when Walf was still alive. Next morning, however, she found him dead. 
His countenance was calm and serene, and apparently he had not moved from the position in his chair in which she had last left him. 